Hey everybody, this is Tommy Miller. I'm the senior pastor at Legacy Church. We're really excited that you decided to join our podcast this morning. Our intention is to give you the information and the resources that you need to bring heaven to earth by walking in the fullness of your identity and your destiny. Enjoy the sermon, enjoy your day, be blessed, and do what Jesus did. faithful. My goodness. Can we pray this morning? Father, thank you so much for bringing us into your house. God, thank you that, uh, that you will restore my voice from my, my worship trip yesterday in my car, and you will restore the speakers in my car. God, I thank you for moments like that with you, and I just ask right now that you do what only you can do, that you bring forth your word, that you bring us revelation, and that you transform us into your very image. Father, we thank you for these this, things this morning, and everybody said... Amen. So I, I do want to just um, touch on a couple things. Brooke already touched on them. I want to share my heart quickly. So the, the academy, um, as Brooke mentioned, we do have some financial aid available. Uh, if your finances were what was keeping you from the academy, I'm, I'm not, yeah, I am. Um, it wasn't finances, it was faith. Because there were a lot of people that went through the academy last year that could not afford it, that, that God provided the means. So understand this, finances was never your problem. I have a feeling that there are somebody or some people sitting here that said, if God were to provide my way, I would do the academy. Now, that doesn't mean that, I, I think the, the, the funds were given with the understanding that they could be partial, they could be full scholarships. But I want you to know that sometimes when God sends your boat, you're looking for something more supernatural than something uh, that looks just too good to be true. You know what I mean? So if you were praying for provision, God gave it. I would act on it. All right. And uh, the growth and the maturity that we've seen come from the academy isn't rivaled by any other ministry we have. And the reason I say that isn't because I'm not a fan of Sunday mornings. It's a, it's a blast in here. But we have a, a year or years set apart, dedicated to kingdom growth. Three hours a week in class, about an hour a day that, that you're required to be studying in a book, in a Bible, whatever it might be. And the growth that takes place in those circumstances is just unrivaled um, when, it, when it's set next to regular church attendance. Are both my mics on now? Check. Can we get rid of that ringing? Check one, check two. It's going to be good here in a minute, I promise. Check one. Excellent. All right, so we are, are finishing up a series through January in our campus classes. And uh, the two series that, that I've taught that draw the most attention, um, one is Satan and Demons. I don't know why everybody loves to learn about that stuff. I hate to teach it, but they absolutely love to learn it. Um, I just don't like paying that much attention to that stuff. Um, second, which I do love to teach, is marriage. So in February, usually about the time of Valentine's Day, we always make sure that we take a moment to set aside time in class to focus on love, sex, and marriage as it pertains to the kingdom and scripture. That is our number one attended study. If you've been through those teachings before, there will be some information that will be a refresher. Most of the information will be new. And I would invite you and anybody else that is interested in those. You don't have to be married. Um, you, you can be uh, um, advanced in years and not looking to be married ever again. But the fact is that the, the marriage bond was the heavenly replica of the, the relationship between Christ and the church. So even if you're not learning how to be a good wife to your husband, you are learning how to be a good wife to God, which is one of the best revelations I've ever received, is learning how to be a good bride, believe it or not. So those are the two things I wanted to share kind of my heart with you on. Now we can get into the Word. You excited? I'm excited. Give the Lord a shout. Turn to the book of James chapter 1, and we're going to start in verse 22. I have a little nephew named Ian. 
when every time he buys a new pair of shoes, he jumps in them. And then he's like, I can jump high in these shoes. Every time I get a new pair of shoes, I preach in them. And there are some that bring more anointing than others. These ones are like a Mach 10. So get ready. James chapter 1 verse 22 says, But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. If anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man that observes his natural face in a mirror. He observes himself, goes away, and immediately forget what kind of man he was. He looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it. He's not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. Now, I'm going to give us six things. I don't usually preach pointed messages unless I really have a point that I'm trying to get across. The point that I'd like to address today is how to be successful in the local church. And the reason that we have to bring things like this up is because we've been grown up in a culture where the church has become consumer-driven rather than kingdom advancing. You following me? And if we're not made aware of the distinction, then we'll think that the way it's been is the way it's supposed to be. And that's not true. The reason I bring this up is because if we don't understand the functioning, the work, and the intention of the local church, we will fall into the trap of thinking that church is for us. When you come to a church service and you hear a preaching, how many of you understand you're not just hearing a new perspective to consider? We're hearing the word of God preached by a vessel from the anointed holy scriptures. And our church culture today has taught us that it's our responsibility to sit in the seat of the church and judge the quality of the preaching rather than receive and submit to the truth. We jump from church to church to church looking for music that's either louder or softer or not so many guitar solos. And we believe that we're supposed to fit in somewhere. Now, this fitting in culture means that we've made the entire workings of the local church about appeasing something in us rather than challenging something in us to cause transformation. It's not that we're bad people. It's the church itself that led us into this lie by thinking we have to provide programs and lights and sounds and earplugs and entertainment so that people will come and people will stay. But how many of you understand that the effective local church has nothing to do with entertainment and everything to do with equipping? <laughs> In the New Testament, I, I want to, I wanna, sometimes you have to go to the context of the original so you're not had by the counterfeit. In the original first century church, guess how many churches there were in each city? One. If you were a believer in Ephesus, you belonged to the body of believers at the Ephesian church. If their music was too loud, you didn't get to skip down to Corinth and tell that pastor how bad the pastor at Ephesus was. Now, luckily, I'm usually on the receiving end of these things. But follow me. So it is such a subtle lie and such a subtle discontentment. Now, I'm not saying if a church isn't being run biblically that you don't leave it and find one that is. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying if you, is if you find a church that preaches truth and equips saints for the work of ministry, don't expect them to scratch your back and appease you. Expect them to challenge you, try you, and transform you in ways that might actually hurt. If you belong to the Ephesian church and you didn't like the color of the carpet, this is, this is so we can understand Paul's, Paul's speaking. He said, don't forsake the assembling together, right? There's people watching on this camera not because 
their kids are sick or because they, they're too far away. There's kids, people watching on that camera because they've been so hurt by the church that they don't think the local church is for them. That is one of the most demonic lies that Satan has ever passed through the span of time and space. Because that means each one of these empty chairs that's being occupied by an online believer means we're missing a gift. And that they're lacking an impartation that only comes by face-to-face -face revelation. When Paul wrote the letter of Romans, it's one of the best letters that we see in all of the New Testament writings. At the end, he said, I'm really praying that I get to come see you. Because if I get to come see you, then I can give you an impartation. It wasn't just about receiving information about the Bible. It was about receiving life and transformation from a gift, from an office. So all of you here, now I'm not trying to knock all of our visitors online. There's a lot of people that can't get here. That's what that's for. The online viewing is not so you can watch from the comfort of your own home. Listen, church isn't supposed to be comfortable. Listen, there was 26,000 brand new Christian converts that got jammed into the church in Ephesus and were expected to get along. It's no different then than it is now, except the more people you have, the more drama and the more conflict you add. Being part of the local church is actually part of the chastisement of the father. The Bible says if God doesn't correct you, you're not a legitimate son. Y'all okay? That means if you don't get a whipping from daddy every once in a while, he don't love you. <laughs> we all want to talk about how bad these kids are, but we don't want to talk about how their parents won't be consistent in their chastisement. Right? And if you don't know my heart, you'll think I'm like, oh, he's one of those spare the rod, spoil the child guys. No, I'm not. I'm not. But what I am saying is this. When we move into 2019, we have to shed the consumer-driven model for church. We're not here to entertain. We're not here to tickle ears. We're here to make sure no more of our kids die of heroin overdoses. We're here to make sure that no more marriages get separated by mnemonic lies. We're here to make sure that people don't die of illnesses that Jesus paid to heal. And then we will do it at the cost of our comfort. That is how the church advances. We cannot listen to me. We can't apologize. I spent most of my life apologizing for the revelation that I have. Sorry, I know, it's, I know you're used to preachers, preachers that tickle your ears and tell you funny stories, but I want to give you life. And we as a church, not just as a ministry, as a church, cannot continue to apologize for the depths of our conviction about the sufficiency of our Savior. Those days are over. Those days are over. So why did I read this passage? James gives us one of the most insightful things. James and Jesus both have a way of questioning what you take for granted. Questioning what you take for granted. If you get into a habit of questioning what you take for granted, you will immediately start to see results in your life because most of the things that you do that are damaging to your life are done from a subconscious level. We don't even realize that we come into church and leave and say, that was a good message. Tell me why. Because the preacher jumped around, because he got loud, because he articulated the scriptures well, because he, he told you something that you didn't know before, or because you looked different when you left. That's the only thing that qualifies a good sermon as a good sermon. And whether or not you're changed or you're educated when you leave depends on how you receive it. James just says, we got to stop hearing sermons, guys. He says, we can't just go listen. I do it all the time. People do it all the time. Turn on a podcast. Why did you turn on that podcast? It's because you wanted to hear, because you wanted to do because you wanted new insight or because you wanted transformation? Because you wanted to win the next argument that you had on immortality or because you wanted to live forever? Oh, it's so good. All right, James says this. <coughs> Be doers of the word and not hearers only. How quick does that cut us? 
How deep does that cut us? Because we would never find ourselves guilty of just hearing the word. It's impossible because we don't realize we're doing it because the church climate that we've been ingrained with. Worship was so good today. Why? Because I've been to a Trans-Siberian Orchestra concert that if judged by the same standard was better. Worship was good today because the presence of God showed up and transformed me. Because Pastor Shanda spent the week in the throne room and invited everybody to come join her on Sunday morning. That's what the difference is. Be doers of the word and not just hearers. If you're a hearer of the word and not a doer, you're like a man that observes his natural face in a mirror. He observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he is. He who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one is blessed in all he does. How many of you have ever heard a message that while you were sitting in the church seat, were absolutely certain was going to change your life, your circumstance, your marriage, or your finances? If I asked you on Wednesday what I said on Sunday, what would you say? Don't know. Do you know why we don't know? Hearing requires no action. And because hearing requires no action, there's no physical, visible, attainable, sustainable transformation that takes place in our life when we don't just hear the word, but we do the word. Doing the word has nothing to do with rights, opinions, or feelings. Doing the word has to do with submission. The first step in becoming a saint is confessing with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. If he's not Lord of everything, then he's Lord of absolutely nothing. So when his word says, be quick to forgive, if you're like, oh, pastor, cut me to the core today, and you don't forgive, nobody cares. You should have clapped. Just so I don't feel bad for saying this. <laughs> I just don't want us to fall in the trap, guys. That's all. We have an amazing church. Legacy Church is phenomenal. And, and, and I say this um, in, in the most humility I possibly can but I don't see a whole bunch of other saints out praying for the sick. I don't see a bunch of testimonies of cancer getting healed. I don't see a bunch of testimonies of the dead being raised from many other ministries. But when I hear about somebody being prayed for in public, crutches being taken away, cancer going away, whatever it might be, be I'm usually like, well, who was it? And then they say, well, it was one of your academy students, or it was one of your leaders, or it was somebody that attends Legacy. So please don't get me wrong. This isn't a word of correction. This is a word of encouragement. This is how we leave 2018 in 2018, jump into 2019, and make sure that we'll be successful and fruitful in what we're attempting or endeavoring to accomplish. In the ancient world, it was common for people to come listen to a teacher. Listen, Matthew chapter 5. One of the most famous sermons that Jesus ever preached. They refer to it as the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, right? That spans Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And what happened? Jesus sat on the mountainside and the multitudes gathered to hear him. Now, that was a normal occurrence. People loved to hear Jesus teach. 13, excuse me, 12 of those men got up and followed Jesus. Because there is a difference between being a student and being a disciple. Jesus was consistently asking or inviting us to become disciples. Do you know what the discerning factor between a student and a disciple was? Students heard, disciples did. Multitudes listened. A dozen did. Follow me. So where we fall 
in this mix of either being a disciple of Jesus Christ or just one of his students is what we do with the word that comes from his mouth. Do you hear it or do you do it? Now, Thursday night, we taught on a little bit of this. And one of the things that we came to the conclusion of, and I said it a few weeks ago, and I want to say it um, clearly so we understand what I'm trying to say. There is a, a, a portion of scripture that, that discloses the fact that God places his word above his name. So God is in submission to his own word. I'll say it this way. God is a doer of the word. Okay? So when you and I receive the word as a good idea or new insight, but we refuse to submit to it, we're actually affording ourselves a liberty that the author of the word will not even take for himself. Follow me? If God were not subject to his own word, then we could never trust him as Lord because he would have no integrity. If he violated his own utterance, it wouldn't be a God that we could follow because we'd never know what he would do next. But because he was, is, and is to come, because he always has been, he is, and he will be, he will never violate the statutes that he has set forth as the creator of the universe, even though with his authority he could. And we as humans in disbelief and unbelief actually afford ourselves a right, a liberty to take a position above God's word that he won't even take for himself. That's rough. When he says you're blameless, perfect, spotless, and holy, and we get all self-righteous, be like, oh, you don't know what's in my head. Ugh. You're placing yourself above God's throne. There was a guy that did that in Isaiah chapter 14, got him in all kinds of trouble. His name was Lucifer. Is this good news? When we receive the word correctly, we place ourselves in subjection to it. When we receive, and I'm not talking, listen, please don't, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about the Mosaic law. That's not the new word we, we receive. It says when you look into the perfect law of liberty, that's the finished work of Jesus Christ. That means when he ascended above every principality, power, might, and dominion, and sat at the right hand of God and brought you to that position with him, that all things are under your feet. So when we start putting ourselves in subjection to circumstance, lies, and accusation, we're actually putting the word of God in subjection to us. My least favorite portion of scripture says, he who does not believe God calls God a liar. That's something I never want to be accused of. And in order for me to never be accused of it, I have to come to a place where I'm willing to receive the truth that he has paid for me to receive on my behalf because of the sufficiency of his son. We're almost there. You'll never guess, all right? We just mentioned the Beatitudes. You'll never guess how Jesus closed the Beatitudes. Everybody know James is Jesus' brother, right? So James writes this letter after the ascension of Jesus, and he says, don't just hear the word, you have to do the word. If you don't do the word, you're like a guy looking in the mirror, you walk away, you forget what you like. It doesn't require any action. Just because you heard it, just because you applauded it, just because you thought it was a fantastic preaching means absolutely nothing. If a pastor comes to the pulpit and reads from Ephesians 5 and says, Husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church. He gave himself for her. When he utters something prophetically in Scripture, he enables you and I to walk it out. So we can't sit in this place of judgment and say, Well, I can't love my wife like that. Jesus doesn't know what my wife is. Come on, he's married to you. That's one of the most insulting things. He, he wrote to Hosea and he said, do you want to know what it's like to be God? Go marry a hooker. 
I'm legit. You need to go read it. He really said that. <laughs> go take for yourself a wife of harlotry. Then you'll know what it's like to be me. <laughs> well, thanks. But listen, when, when his word comes forth, there is a divine inspiration upon the word that allows you to carry it out into provision. He doesn't give commandments for the fun of it. Like, watch this. Your dad doesn't set something for you to jump over just to watch you fall on your face. That's not how he functions. That's not his heart. It's not his character. So when he brings something to light in the word, he doesn't expect us to sit and judge it and say, well, I don't know. No, be a doer of the word. And then Jesus, James's brother, <coughs> certainly where James got the inspiration for this principle was at the end of Matthew chapter 7 after he got done with his most famous sermon. He said... If you hear these words of mine, Jesus's, and do them, I'll liken you to a wise man. Actually, let's start with the foolish man first because I think he did. No, he didn't. I'll liken you to a wise man. He built his house upon the rock. The wind came, the rain fell, and the house stood. Right? But if you hear these words of mine and don't do them. Then I'll liken you to a foolish man who built his home on sand. The wind came, the rain fell, the house fell too, and great was the fall. Now, what is this passage disclosing that is vitally important for you and I to understand? that all of us endeavor to build the same project. All of us are coming into Christ-likeness and kingdom. Both of these men tried to build a house, right? Follow me through this because it makes a lot of sense. Please, 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 please. Their foundation was not exposed until the storm. It's easy to have faith when you don't need it. It's easy to forgive when someone asks for it. It's easy to love when someone loves you back. The crux of Christianity is that it's founded on a principle called grace. Unmerited, undeserved favor. Meaning we're supposed to love the unlovable, forgive the unforgivable, and we're supposed to believe the impossible. And when the impossible comes knocking at our door, we will know if we're going to submit to the wind and rain or we're going to submit to the word and be a doer of it by if our house stands or falls. Every, I submit to you this, <coughs> every believer looks the same until they go through something. Every believer looks the same until they go through something. How did you handle your last trial? And listen, this isn't to bring condemnation on anybody. This is to bring freedom. Because the moment the wind comes and you know that there's rock under you, you don't have to be pushed. The moment the wind blows and you know that you're founded on something that's immovable, you don't have to fall over. As a matter of fact, your stride doesn't have to change, your schedule doesn't have to change, your bank account doesn't have to change just because something's blowing and falling. Following me? You're quiet. Either you're listening or you're mad. That giggle tells me that you're covering up your anger. I'm just kidding. Charles Spurgeon says, the wise and the foolish man both engaged in exactly the same vocation. And to con a considerable extent, they achieved the same design. Both of them undertook to build houses. Both of them persevered in building. Both of them finished their houses. The likeness between them to the naked eye was considerable. Nothing was revealed about their differences until the storm came. It's super easy to believe the word when the word's being manifest in front of you. That's the opposite of faith. Jesus told his disciples, he says, blessed are you because you've seen. He said, but they're more blessed who believe and don't see. 
there is a blessing, a happiness, something that is allocated to you for continuing to find God faithful when you're hoping against hope. God likes to ask questions. I think he, I think he wants to ask one. This isn't to expose or, 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 or condemn anybody, but how'd you handle your last trial? How'd you handle your last trial? How did it help you? No matter, no matter if, if you stood on the word or if you just got jacked around by the, the circumstance, how did it help you? If you stood on the word and you made it through the last, last big storm, fantastic, do it again. But if your worry, your fear, and your anxiety cost you your peace, your family, your marriage, and your job, then why you wanna try that again? Sometimes just questioning the things we take for granted. Now, I, I mentioned this Thursday night. I mentioned it. I mentioned it here. I'm about to get into those six points we talked about. <coughs> there is a a preacher, not a prophet, a preacher named Jeremiah Johnson. There's two men in international ministry right now with the same name. This is the surfer-looking guy. Super cool, amazing grace preacher. He's just a breath of fresh air when he when when he teaches. He was on a bus to North Africa, and he was getting ready to preach. And he's a, he's a Western guy. He's from around here. And, uh, and on the way to North Africa, they start passing people on the streets. And they said, who, who are these guys? And they said, they're, they're going to the conference. He said, what conference? He said, your conference. He said, well, how far are we from the conference? He's about eight hours. He's like, these people are walking? He said, yeah, they'll walk two and a half days. For what? To hear you preach. What don't you understand? He said, well, shoot, people won't drive 45 minutes to hear me preach at home. These people are on foot for two and a half days. And then guess what happened? And I'm not, I'm, I really just want to expose the weakness of Western Christianity. I'm not trying to get emotional. I'm not trying to guilt people. But I do want us to understand how big, how powerful, how effective, and how sufficient Jesus is. Their bus was attacked on the way to North Africa. And they forced the children to get off the bus that Jeremiah Johnson was on. And then they eliminated the children. And then the occupants of the bus got back on the bus. Guess where they went? The conference. Do you know why they went to the conference? Because there's only one thing that can get you through the loss of your child. And they were so desperate to receive peace they were so desperate to receive comfort that they knew that going and being, I don't know what the right word is because this is such a tender subject. They knew that retracting from their faith at that moment because they had been served a disgusting injustice would not help them get through it. So they went to the conference. Now, here's the challenge. You've got a Western preacher Western preachers, they're, they're largely forced to preach feel-good messages. We don't do that here. So he gets there, and he knows his audience either A, walked two and a half days to get there, or B, just suffered the loss of their child yesterday. Now what do you tell them? Jesus loves you. How do you like our lights? Was the music the right decibel level for you? Or is there a message that transcends all other messages that says Jesus is enough? That he brings peace beyond understanding, that in his presence is the fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. That there's a message of hope that death is no longer the end of humanity because of Jesus' resurrection, and that faith in Christ promises them a reunion with their child someday. Listen, no other message affords us that. And it is absolutely impossible to draw close to the one that provides it when you're worrying about being appeased by the church that preaches him. I'm going to pull us back up out this emotional pit and we'll get good here in a second, okay? Okay. <laughs> Can I share with you the six things 
that we should resolve to do moving into 2019 to afford us success and fruitfulness in the kingdom? Can I share six things with you? I'll share them quick. Number one, you ready for this one? Again, some of these are so matter of fact, so common that we don't take a moment to question them. But we need to evaluate ourselves in the stance that we've taken. Ready? Number one is know Jesus. I want to use an illustration that I'm, I'm actually stealing from a man that was present at the moment, but there's a, a preacher that I listen to named Kirby Delanero. He's from Sri Lanka. And Kirby's spiritual father was a man named Kobus Van Rensburg. And Kobus Van Rensburg died at age 61 from a, a cancer diagnosis. And when Kirby and all of Kobus's other spiritual sons were in a circle talking about their memories with Prophet Kobus, they were saying, hey, do you remember that one time that Kobus just threw you the keys to a car and was like, Merry Christmas? Do you remember the one time that Kobus sowed money into your ministry? Do you remember how much time that Kobus gave to you for training? Do you remember when you called him in the middle of the night and he was there? And then this entire circle of preachers has their attention drawn to a man sitting in the front seat of the funeral. That man was Kobus Van Rensburg, Jr., Cobus's son. And Cobus Jr. was not talking about the gifts that his father gave him. He was talking the loss of the relationship that his father's death had cost him. As believers, we have to bring ourselves in check because there has been a consistent history of the tendency to worship the gift over the giver. And it is, it is just as dangerous to forget about the kingdom for the sake of the king. That's a spit in his face because the kingdom is our inheritance because of him. But it is just as easy to turn our back on him and wallow in the inheritance that he left for us and forget about him. Without Jesus, the kingdom is just another self-help book. There is no first fruits. There is no firstborn from the dead. There is no king of all these kings. There is no Lord of all these lords. And outside of a relationship with Jesus, obedience to this word isn't worth it. Why are you healed? Because your king got beat to death. Why are you saved? Because your king died and paid the punishment for every Mosaic law that you ever broke. Paul, in, in 2 Corinthians, he said, if you want to know why we minister the way we do, if we have the perspective that we have, it's because the love of Christ compels us. It's not because it's a good idea. It's because we have reverence for a king that paid for us, that loves us, that we're in communion with. Paul even talked about the gospel that he preached. He said, I've never heard this gospel preached by a man before. He said, I received it from Jesus Christ. How many of you know Paul didn't meet Jesus until Jesus ascended? His ministry was birthed from a relationship that took 14 years to foster. John 17, 3 says, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Everybody hold up your Bible. <coughs> that is a very important tool for faith and life, no matter what anybody tells you. But please understand that all of the patriarchs and the disciples that you look up to did not have one. They did not have one. Paul did not heal the sick because his written scripture told him to. Paul healed the sick because he was part of the generation that witnessed ribbons of skin hanging off of an innocent savior.
He was not motivated by a written word. He was motivated by a person named Jesus. The struggle, the battle that you and I face as believers is the battle to keep our eyes fixed on the author and the finisher of faith, not on the task at hand, not at the blessings available, but on the giver and the commissioner of the task and the blessings. I've got so much I could say, my goodness. I could preach four weeks on knowing Jesus. <clears throat> Paul had the opportunity to go to Jerusalem where the rest of the disciples were, but instead he spent 14 years in Damascus by himself. That's where the revelation that fills two thirds of our New Testament comes from. In the kingdom, one of the most simple principles of the kingdom also happens to be the hardest. The kingdom is no longer a concept when you're surrounded, excuse me, surrendered to the king. Jesus as a concept, excuse me, <coughs> Jesus as a concept cannot be personally submitted to. But Jesus as a person will yield your surrender. I'm going to get moving. We're running out of time. Number two. This is kind of a, a bold one, but you need to understand. Reject all blended covenant teaching. Reject all blended covenant teaching. One of the things that Paul consistently fought was the need for the church to have a list of to do's in order to inherit something. Paul taught a gospel of grace that almost, well, excuse me, on multiple occasions cost him his life. I'll read you what he wrote. After 14 years, I went again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me. I went up by revelation. I communicated to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of rep reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And this occurs because of false brethren secretly brought in, who came in by stealth to spy out the liberty that we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue. Understand what just happened, right? The church was walking in freedom. They were walking in truth. They were new. They weren't held by rules. They were motivated by Jesus. And they walked in new identities. And then people came into the church. And they said, you can't just throw away that law of Moses. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. If you want a longer teaching on that, I don't have the time right now. But Hebrews chapter 7 says, when the priesthood changed, the law changed. Of necessity, there has to be a removal of the old so the new can come. That which was glorious is passing away so that that's more glorious can invade our lives. Listen. The moment that you start striving to be is the moment you've stepped out of the third heaven and into some kind of carnal, earning and deserving an existence. And the preaching that you receive will come as leaven. It doesn't sound super convincing. It doesn't sound super legalistic. But the moment you're no longer resting in what's already true because what Jesus did and you're trying to do something to be like Jesus is, you've stepped back into legalism reject all blended covenant teaching. <clears throat> Can you tell me why people think legalistic preaching is good preaching? I've been to so many meetings where I want to vomit because the guy's just like, you didn't tithe and you're sleeping with so-and-so and you're doing this and you're doing that. And everyone's like, tell them preacher. And I'm like, my God. Everybody loves it. People flock to it. Step on my toes. No, set me free. Set me free. I don't need more bondage. I know, what, I know what's wrong with me. Set me free from it. That's what the gospel does. So much to teach. Number three. This is one of my, my personal... I, I don't know if, if I call it secrets, but just one of the things that David Barlock told me when I first came into ministry... He says, stay humble. <clears throat> we don't quite understand biblical humility until we understand the way God operates. He said he gives grace to the humble and he rejects the proud. So when you position yourself under him, you're a constant conduit for what he has to offer. The moment you put yourself over him, you've confessed that you're in authority of him and you're no longer in position to receive. So you have to be rejected when you've placed yourself above his word that's placed above his name right? 
But if he says you're perfect, you just say, okay. Blameless, you said it. Spotless, whatever you say. Holy, really? Yep, okay. That's humility. Humility is the ability to receive. That's what humility is, biblically. Lao Tzu says, all streams flow to the sea because it's lower than they are. Humility gives it its power. If you want to govern people, you place yourself below them. If you want to lead people, you must learn to follow them. <coughs> C.S. Lewis says, do not imagine that if you meet a really humble man, he will be what most people call humble. He will not be some sort of greasy, smarmy person who is always telling you that, of course, he is nobody. Probably all you think about him is that he seemed cheerful, he was intelligent, he took an interest in what you had to say. If you dislike him, it's because you feel a little envious of someone who enjoys life so e easily. He will not be thinking about humility. He will not be thinking of himself at all. Number four, <coughs> commit to renewing your mind. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and the acceptable and perfect will of God. This is part of the process of humility because you and I are used to seeing tragedy and then responding with anxiety. That's just how we're raised. That's how we're normal. The fear is actually supposed to work in your favor. When you see it, when you step out in front of a car, the reason you were able to run so fast is because fear worked in your favor. It enabled you to get out of a certain situation. What we've turned that into is a life of fear or a life of anxiety because we don't trust that God will meet our needs. And then fear no longer works for you, you work for it. So we have to come to a place where part of humility is renewing our minds, where what we see no longer is responded to by what we used to believe, but by what he says. So now when we see poverty, of course you're going to think about needs. But you have to say, no, that's not what the word says. You have to take that thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And then if it doesn't match a thought that he would think, you have to give it the eviction notice from your head. Number five, declare independence. You have to become more familiar with the training and the culture of heaven than you are familiar with the training and the culture of the fallen world. Chances are you don't even realize how far from heavenly culture we are until we study it and see that what we live, what we know, and what we value are not a lot like Jesus. Sometimes we get stuck living according to systems that have cycles that make it tick. <coughs> this is kind of how the kingdom works. The kingdom works in the, the avenue, or I guess the structure of cycles. And if we can put a stop to worldly cycles, we can introduce kingdom advancement. I'm going to use trials, for example, right? Let me borrow somebody. Larissa, come up here real quick. Okay, Larissa. Larissa's been through some things in her life. Larissa is one of our academy students, and Larissa has grown exponentially over this last year. What we don't realize is how much influence we have as a human in the things that we face every day. So we personally have to confess to making a declaration of independence from the way things used to work and a strict adherence to the way God causes us to respond. For example, let's say Larissa goes through something tough. You ever been through something tough? Yeah? I don't want to bring any of them up because they're rough. Um, let's make one up for you. Um, I was engaged and found out that my fiance was gay and he broke up with me. Rough, right? Okay, now here's the cycle. Larissa, the book of James says, consider it all joy when you fall into various trials that the testing of your patience, excuse me, the testing of your faith might produce patience, patience would have its perfect work. That is a cycle, right? So Larissa gets hit with this trial and she's like, yay! Startles everyone around her, why? 
because she is no longer adhering to the world cycle. She's independent of it, and she can see things through the lens of heaven. So now there's spectators in her cycle. Everybody around her knew what was happening. But instead of coming to a place of anxiety, depression, and isolation, she comes to joy, peace, and long-suffering. And everybody's like, what is wrong with this girl? Right? But I'm, I'm not trying to be extreme, but okay, she goes to anxiety, depression, and isolation. What happens? All of her friends are trying to help her. They're trying to reach out. They're trying to assist. And she's like, guys, I just don't feel like talking, you know. And, and we think that it's noble because that's how we've always seen things handled before. So what happens? We've got five of Larissa's friends out here that now are being influenced by the way that she's handling this problem. So when she chooses anxiety, depression, and isolation, all of us are now affected because not only did she lose a good, you know, potential, I said too many things that aren't true. Um, <laughs> she lost a fiance, right? But now five people have lost a friend and an influence. It had a ripple effect to what she was put on this earth to continue, to, right? You follow me? Now, let's take this to the extreme. It's not something that could have, should have, or would have happened, but listen. Some people are driven by lies to use bullets as band-aids. All that does is transfer the immense amount of pain that this girl was feeling to everybody that knows and loves her. Now we have 15 people that lost their friend, their daughter, their, their sister, whatever it might be. And now we have 15 more cycles. And for God's sake, somebody has to work the cycle differently. Or it's going to continue. And then these 15 people are going to be anxious, depressed, and isolated. And everybody around them is going to lose a friend. And then we've got 15 times 15. And the world shares a subconscious of continued anxiety, depression, and isolation. 90% of women in our country are on antidepressants. That's not your fault. Now what happens when the church is like, watch this. Joy, peace, and long suffering. Now these same five people are like, I remember when Larissa, they're going through the worst thing in their life. I remember when Larissa lost her fiance. And I remember that God was sufficient to keep her through. And the God of Larissa is the same God that's going to keep me in my trial. And guess what? All 15 of their friends get to say, I remember when Tommy said Larissa's God was sufficient. And when he put faith in Larissa's God, he got through. I'm going to put faith in Tommy's God. And those cycles are broken because of the way we respond to the system. We have no idea. Thank you so much, Larissa. You're wonderful. We have no idea how much influence we have in the simple things in the kingdom. When you declare independence from the system, you become a conduit of heaven. You change everything. You respond to poverty with wealth. You respond to sickness with prayer. You respond to death with life. You respond to trials with joy. You just become this weird, weird, what's the peculiar person they were in a, uh, a wood pile and Paul got bit on the hand by a viper. Everybody around him's like, uh, he's cursed. We should have known it. We should have left the sucker in the water. He's going to die. And then Paul looks at the snake and goes, and keeps working. Because he had a truth ingrained in him that no thing could ever poison him that he had dominion over every creeping thing on the earth, especially the serpent. Bit him in the hand, he shook it off, and he kept working. How do you think the rest of those men felt? Surely this man's God is Lord. He responded differently to the system. Woo, I'm almost done. Actually, if you knew how many notes I'd have, Declare adherence to the kingdom system. After this, I'll pray for you. <clears throat> the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered in them, Many works I have done and shown you from my Father. 
For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him and said, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you being a man make yourself God. Jesus answered them, It is written in your law, I said, you are gods. If he called them gods, to whom the word came, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? This is where it gets good. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you may not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and believe the Father is in me and I am in him. Therefore they sought again to seize him, but he escaped out of their hand. There was this consistent message preached throughout the New Testament. Paul said it this way. He said, the kingdom of God is not talk, it's power. Paul said that I didn't come to you with persuasive words, but a display of the power of God. Jesus said, if I don't do what I say my father can do, don't believe the word I say. He said, I'm going to tell you the son, and then I'm going to attest to my sonship by my favor. And if you don't see the favor, don't believe that I'm a son. So there was a doing accompanying his hearing and his speaking that, that confirmed him to be authentic. Can I go through those six again? Not like I just went through them. Number one, know Jesus. Number two, reject blended covenant teaching. Number three, way back there. Be humble. Number four, renew your mind. Number five, declare independence. And number six, declare adherence to. I believe that what God wants to speak to us going into 2019 is this simple. Don't just hear this word anymore. Do it. Everything that he speaks, he empowers. Everything that he requires, he gives. He is a God of more than enough. Amen? Amen. Stand with me.